What's up, everybody? We're here with episode eight. I know it's been a little bit of a, a time off. I've been traveling quite a bit, more than normal. My wife's ready to kill me. Um, my kids do remember who I am, but I'm back. You know, we had some trips, but uh, we're ready to get caught up, get back in the swing of things, and uh, get things going. We have a lot to catch up on, but we're going to have uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Greg Ribs or Bello. He's going to Skype in a little bit later. He's got a, a fight coming up next week. He's the main event. Defending his uh, CS heavyweight title on UFC Fight Pass. That'll be uh, Friday, uh, the 26th, so uh, a week from today, but really probably a few days after this airs. And um, we'll have him on. And then, as always, we got the man Brendo here. Yo, what up? What's up, buddy? How you been? I've been good. You know, it's summer. It's vacation time. It's okay. You got the new haircut? A little bit. I mean, it's just longer. It's like just it. longer. I wish I could do haircut. I just bald, so it's you can. <laughs> I mean, it might look a little different. Grow it out on the back. No, on the top too. Yeah, you know, might look like a horseshoe, but that's fine. So uh, I'm excited to have Greg on. Um, Greg's, like I said, he's a CS heavyweight champ. He's got like 35 pro fights. He fought to get on the Ultimate Fighter. Um, he was two times fought in the Dana White Contender Series. So he's a extreme veteran. He helps coach some of my uh, the fighters that I manage. And, um, you know, he's a teammate to some of the other ones, and he's just like a kind of an OG of the New England MMA scene, so I'm excited to have him on. And there's a rumor he really likes Vegas, too. <laughs> Greg loves Vegas. <laughs> um, so I just, I guess first we'll just catch up on the last six weeks. We had a big win in Chicago for Calvin Cater, cracking big. the top ten. Huge. First round knockout over uh, Ricardo Lamas, who was ranked number nine at the time. Uh, you know, he fought amazing in that fight and that was a, a big statement fight for him um i think i posted this on social media but i think the rest of the world's now seeing what we already knew which is that calvin's a true contender in the featherweight division um he came out fought real smart drew some uh counters out of him and then and then cracked him when it needed to happen like he, he was real patient uh he showed everybody that he can check a leg kick <laughs> that's what he's really most excited about is that he checked a leg kick and uh, and then he got that finish, so it was uh, it was exciting, man. Like Chicago, and Chicago, the the place we were staying there, it was actually a pretty cool city. Uh, it was real safe, the area we were in. A lot of restaurants right outside the hotel. Twenty four hour Walgreens, which is always nice. Yep. And then did you um, buy a fan. I did buy a fan. Nice. I I buy a fan every fight week, and then my wife gets mad that I waste the money. But hey, what can you do? You can try to sleep in a little bit less noise, but I don't think that'll happen. Yeah, I yeah. like the wind. But uh, yeah, so Calvin, man, we're freaking. That was he's a scary, scary man now. Yeah, and he's uh, he's got a big future ahead of him. You know, obviously it's one fight at a time. You're only as good as your last fight. But right now, he's amazing because his last fight was amazing. Yeah, so it was really good. Um, from there, you know, uh, Slippery Pete, he had a big, uh, big win at Cage Titans, first round knockout. You know, he had been on a little bit of a, uh, I want to say slump, but he was having some rough patches. You know, he started out I think eight or nine and zero, and then. Had like kind of one up, one down for a few fights, and uh, he had a big statement when I, I think the kid was five and one, and he knocked him out in the first round. Tough kid, so uh, it's nice to see him back in his winning ways. And then um, the contender series, Jorgen De Castro, biggest underdog on the card, the first fight to ever take place in the new Apex Center for the UFC, where they're doing the contender series this year. And uh, I think he was a six to one underdog. They brought in like a olympic level wrestler he didn't make the olympic team but he was like training with them and he's supposed to like an alternate or something and uh defended all the takedowns did really well and then got a stoppage by leg kick in the first round yeah um i was so happy for him he we call him like the brown santa claus like he's just like a happy go lucky guy like he's just always smiling and laughing super appreciative like i you know i was just we watched that fight in greenville um in between training sessions with Rob, we just watched the fight on the phone and we were just so happy. And at the end, when he got the contract, we yelled like little girls. We were just super excited for him. Is there any video of that? Or can you at least give us a demonstration of what it sounded like? <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> no, I think uh, Ross, who our guest on our last episode, Ross was filming the whole thing. Like, So he was filming us watching the fight. He was filming us getting the reaction. Um, it's cool, man. Those moments, like those moments, are special. You know, to see him, the first kid from his gym. You know, uh, Regiment Training Center. He's a teammate of Mitch Raposo. He's one of your favorite boys. This yep. boy, right, right here. 
your boy Mitch. Yeah. So he was um, the first guy in that gym to make the UFC. So it was a, a big deal for, for obviously him and his family. But that whole gym, like to see that first guy crack it into the big show, that's a, a big moment for, for everybody involved, the coaches, him, his family, his teammates. Um, it's also big for New England. So I'm excited about that. And then uh, he just found out last week he's going to make his uh, UFC debut October 5th in Australia. Ooh. Yep, so he's going to fight a guy who's 3-0. and um, I think it's John. I don't know. I remember that kid's name. But, yeah, the kid's 3-0. and Like his 12-2 and kickboxer, 3-0 and MMA. So he's going out there. And he's got one of those Australians with all the cool tattoos. Yep. You know? So he looks the part. So that'll be an exciting fight. That's UFC 243, I believe. Excellent. So we're, we're in the middle of uh, planning all that. And then, unfortunately, now we need to talk about Greenville. So when we were in Chicago... We got the call that uh, Cody Stamen had pulled out against Rob. That was a big fight, number 11 versus number 10. And, um, you know, within two hours, you know, we asked to fight uh, Lineker. John Lineker. We said, hey, is Lineker available? He's been complaining for fights. So we asked the UFC, I was like, well, can we fight John Lineker? We want that rematch. And, like, within two hours, we had about agreement. So we're going to fight John Lineker, co main event in Greenville. We're all excited. You know, we made some adjustments in the you know the, the final couple weeks of training. Went out there, and then Thursday night, so we're weighing in at 9 a.m. So Thursday night at 10:30, the UFC reached out and they're like, "Hey, stop cutting weight." You know, Lineker's out. So it just sucked. Um, you know, Rob didn't get to fight. He really wanted the rematch. Obviously, you know, it's a financial burden too. Like, you know, you don't get to fight, you don't get to win all that money. Um, it, it was just. You feel gutted, you know? Like, that's mm. a word you can use. Like, just you put in a full camp. You have all these expenses. You have all this, like, I guess, you know, I'm going to say be corny and say hopes and dreams, but you have all these things, like, all right, a win over John Lineker, like, it really opens up a lot of doors for someone like Rob. You know, it's you're erasing a loss. You're beating a guy that, like, a lot of people are scared of. And I, I really think Rob could have finished him. So it was just, it was tough to take in a lot of ways um so greenville was tough it was a cool city we were, we were staying in a cool part uh the people were really nice the fights still ended up being good um but it's just you know i'll always have a sour taste in my mouth just because of what happened have you walked in or talked to anybody that actually believed he cut his eye i did see him yeah i, I saw lineker when he was leaving the hotel the next day uh he came up and gave you know dat me up and he pulled up his sunglasses and showed me. He did have like a big bruise right here. I didn't see a cut, but it was like a, it was all red. It was a swollen, and there was like kind of like the white mark in the middle of like where it was probably still pretty ripe. Yeah. I didn't see a cut. Maybe there was a cut. I don't know. But um, at the end of the day, like it sucks that he didn't fight. But I always try to err on the side of caution. Is like if that was our team and my fighter for whatever reason said. I know I could technically fight, but I just don't feel confident fighting because of this. Mm -hmm. Man, it's hard to really like be mad at the kid, you know? Like, so I don't know. It's just I'm not in his camp. I don't know what happened. I don't know what didn't happen. I can speculate all I want. At the end of the day, it's just it's unfortunate that it happened, you yeah, know? Because I think definitely. it would have been a really good scrap. It would have been Rob's first co-main event, um, redemption on a loss. It would have opened up a lot of doors, I think, for Rob. Um, financially, it would have been much better off for Rob. Um, you know, it's tough. It's just so that was freaking Greenville. And then, but while we were in Chicago, um, the announcers were telling us that, or not the announcers, some people in the UFC, they were telling us that there's rumors of a UFC Boston card. So this is back in June. And they were like, yeah, we hear that the UFC's come back to Boston in, uh, in October. And we're like, all right, let's do this. Let's load this thing up. Let's have a reenactment of UFC 220, you know? And then Calvin gets the knockout. And um, and then Dana pulls us aside out back and talked to Calvin. Like, he talked to the whole team in the room. And he was just like, yeah, I think we're coming back to Boston. And Calvin's like, I'm on. And that's what we put nice. on. We started to put it on the press of, like, we want to be the main event. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll see how that all pans out. You know, right now, we have, you know, we've been told some stuff, but we can't really talk about it yet. But, um you know, we're just hoping to load that card up with a bunch of Boston guys. And, you know, that I think our fans will come out 
And hopefully we can have them all wearing New England cartel shirts. Yep. Bright color so everybody stands out. And then just every single Boston guy that's on that card will have everybody else's fans cheering for them too. So I think that's the goal there. And um, so, yeah, hopefully we can get the Boston card. That's so now we have a date. It's October 18th at the TD Garden. It's a Friday night. It's on ESPN. So it's like a big ESPN. So the TV, not the ESPN Plus. Why is it a Friday night? Because they have because because of ESPN does so much college football. Oh, so a Saturday night would be tough because now you're cutting into like the big college football football games. Got it. So I think that's the reasoning for the. If it was on ESPN Plus, it would probably be Saturday night. Yeah. But because it's an ESPN TV card, it made more sense. And that was what someone in um, one of the broadcasters told me. They explained it to me. That's why. It could be a total lie. I don't know, but that guy knows a lot more than I do. So I'll I'll go with it. How about that. Yeah. How about that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, and then, fortunately, like the one thing we did get is when in Greenville, when everything went to crap, um, you know, we were kind of there a couple of days uh, with, you know, not a lot to do, you know, but like we're kind of stuck there because it would have been like crazy expensive to change our flights. So I tried to make the most of my time and I actually sat down with the athlete relations team and um, we were able to sneak Calvin and Rob onto the International Fight Week agenda. So they were able to do uh, a few events out there. So they got flown out. They got to go to the, the John Jones fight, them and a plus one. Um, they got to stay there for free. They were already planning on going out anyway, mm -hmm. so it was good. We got their flights paid for, the hotels paid for, saved them a bunch of money, and then they did uh, a few events that they got paid for. And, that, you know, from what I hear from Calvin, is it was a blast. Like, it was cool sitting on center stage, signing the autographs, having a bunch of cameras, you know, walking the red carpet for different events, um, getting to answer fan questions that so we get to play video games against other people, like some fans and stuff like that. They even made him like a New England cartel sh uh, rogue gaming shirt or something like that, mm -hmm. I think. So that was pretty cool. Uh, so I'm glad they got to have fun. They're getting a little bit of a push from the, from the UFC team there, which is nice. That's good to see. Yeah. So I was happy with that. And like right now, Calvin's in San Antonio right now. He's doing a Metro PCS uh, appearance today in, um, in San Antonio from like three to four their time. So he'll be meet, doing a meet and greet there for an hour. So he gets paid for that, which is nice. So, you know, and, and it's cool for them to just, and his sister lives out there. So he gets to go see his sister, go watch the fights, get paid to do it. And uh, it's always good when like you can kill two birds with one stone, but I'm glad that they're, uh, they're getting a little bit of a push from the UFC now. So that's, that's exciting. Yeah. It's good to have them actually in front of people. People get to see their personalities too. So and they're, they're so good when they're in front of people. Yeah. Like, um, I think they parlay off each other really good. Like anytime, you know, those who interviews, no one really texts me about it. But then when they do interviews together, they, uh, I get texts from random people be like, dude, these guys should have a reality show. Like them two together, they're just wild. So uh, I'm glad they got a little bit of love there. But then on International Fight Week, I ended up going out there and um, the day after the big fight. So I went out there Sunday and then me and Calvin spent the rest of the week together, a few days in Vegas and then Sacramento. But um, when we were in Vegas... Calvin co-hosted uh, the MMA Junkie Radio, so he did that, and I get to jump on there for like probably the last twenty minutes, so that was cool. And then, so how was it being on the other side again for the podcast? It was cool. You know, they ask you questions. It's a lot easier answering questions than asking. Yeah. Um, but it was cool. I mean, those guys are like awesome. George and um, his team. They're always they they have like a studio like this in Mandalay Bay, so you get in there, and then Jorge Masvidal came in. Um, he, he did part of the show with Calvin, so it was pretty cool just seeing them all interact, and uh, it was fun. And that was like a few days after he... Yep, that was the yeah. Monday. So it was two days after he got that big knockout over, over Askren. So that was fun. And then uh, we went to... You know, then we had the Contender Series again that Tuesday, which was... Um, Sumter was a heavy favorite, fighting um, a kid from Hawaii, Maki Patolo. And... Uh, you know, he lost in the first round. He got hit some pretty vicious body shots, and he went down. He's fine. But, uh, man, that kid's so good. And it's just now it's two years in a row he's lost in the Contender Series, and I feel for him because I know he's good enough to fight in the UFC and win fights. Um, but just, you know, the margin of error at that level is just so slim. What's next for a guy like that? So him, like, I mean, he Bellator likes him. Um He's from Connecticut. Bellator comes to Connecticut a few times a year. So we're going to try to push for him to be on one of the – Bellator's doing two cards in October. So if we can slide him back in on one of those cards, get a win, 
and then get another win this winter, whether it be Bellator, CES. Like he really likes fighting for CES too, and now CES is doing shows in Connecticut, so it makes sense, you know. So there's still plenty of options. He's young enough. He's still good. Um, he's only losing to UFC guys, you yeah. know. Um, so I think, you know, the f- the future is still bright with him, you know. And I know right now he's back at home enjoying like his newborn. He has a cute little baby, and um, you know he's pretty optimistic about. You know what's next he's not good you know, he's taking it well so yeah. i was happy to see that and then from there me and calvin flew out on uh spirit airlines oh so, yeah i've heard good things <laughs> yeah, don't, don't ever fly spirit airlines it was cheap it was like 50 dollars to fly from vegas to sacramento the seats don't recline they're like little plastic seats with a little cushion and they're like, they come around, they're like, dude, would you like to buy soda or snacks? And we're like, you don't get free soda? The carry-ons are like 20 or 40 or $50 for a carry-on. Like if you had a bag that get, had to get stowed away. So I'll try not to fly them again, but that was an adventure. And then we went to Sacramento for Big Mike. And um, he was the biggest favorite on the card from what I remember. And he lost the decision. It was, you know, two weeks prior, we got a replacement. We were supposed to fight Jean Vellante. And then we ended up fighting this big kid out of uh, shoot box. And, you know, I mean, it's tough. Like, Mike's such a good dude. He's got such a good team around him. He had such positive vibes going into the fight. Fight week, I think, went smooth. And um, sometimes you just don't win, you know? Yeah. Like, I don't think – I don't. I think it was more like the other kid fought real smart. Like, usually yeah, takedowns. Take yeah, the takedowns, but also the other kid was really, like, taking Mike's weapons away. Like, anytime Mike got, like, close enough to him to really pop off some of those knees or elbows, the kid was, like, in. Mm-hmm. You know, so th- th- that kid fought really smart. You got to give props to that. Mike didn't quit. He was kind of rocked a little bit. And um, he was saying that he was having some, like, depth perception issues during the fight. Like, he, he, like, didn't mean to crowd him as much as he did. But, like, it was kind of during the second round, he said things were a little, not fuzzy, I don't want to say that word, but... He said he was just like, for some reason, he couldn't gauge distance as mm-hmm. well as he wanted to. And then the third round, it started to come back, and then he got taken down. So it was just just a fight that got got away from him. And uh, But I think he put up a post on Instagram. I think it was yesterday or the day before. Um, it was like a video, and it was just about like, hey, guys, you know, sometimes things don't go, go your way. But all you got to do is you got to get back on and start grinding again. We could probably show it. Howard, you can probably find that on his Instagram. We could send it to you. Sometimes things don't go your way, whether it's in a fight, whether it's in your game, whether it's your every day-to-day work, whatever. Just the shit don't go your way. You can't stop trucking for it. You can't stop being optimistic and don't stop grinding. Just keep grinding. Um, but I like that. Like You just had a tough loss. You were a heavy favorite. And your first thing is a positive message about like, all right, guys, hey, crap happens. Let's go. You know, yeah. um, so I was really proud of him for that. He seems like in good spirits and, uh, you know, he's he's got a solid team around him. So I think you know, he's going to bounce back. Like he'll, he'll be fine. And um, but one thing that was fun is getting to hang out with uh, Nick Newell and Eddie George when I was in Vegas with Calvin. Those two should have a reality show as well. Like, oh, yeah. Nick Newell is just hilarious. He's just He's like a low-key crap talker, but funny. And then they have all their inside jokes that I started to act like I was part of, you know? And um, So how would people know Nick Newell? So Nick Newell, I think easiest low-hanging fruit way to describe him is he's the one-armed fighter. Um, he's obviously a lot more than that, but that's the easiest way people know him. Mm-hmm. Um, but kid's a beast. He's like, I think he's 15 and 2 or 15 and 1 now. 15 and 1, right? Something yeah, like that, Yeah, he was 14 yeah. and 0 and then lost and then just won. So 15 and 1. Um you know, it'd be nice to see him get on a, a, a UFC card. He just had a nice win for CES. So it'd be cool to see him get his spot in the UFC. You know, it was cool to hang out with him. Like, he's always, you know, Skyping with his baby, showing me pictures. So I can relate to that. And, um, and then he had his little sidekick, Eddie George. He's an amateur fighter, but he's just, like, so loyal to Nick. Like, he calls him coach the whole time. He's like, yes, coach, whatever you need, coach. Like, I think he would kill someone if Nick asked him to. Um, little, you know, Jacked, rugby. He's probably five nine, pretty jacked, solid kid, and uh, he's freaking hilarious, dude. Like, but I did beat him in arm wrestling. Did you? Oh, I saw uh, that yeah. video. Yeah, I beat him. Eddie, you're all show, no go. Okay, I told him that. He's a little, 
Is Maybe he gonna, young, but the, the old bear still got some strength. Is he uh, is he training for the next, for the rematch? Yeah. Or is it <laughs> Good is, luck. is he done with that? <laughs> I think he knows that he'll never beat me. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was the kind of our West Coast tour. I got back home Sunday morning on a red eye, spent some time with my kids. I was a zombie for a couple of days, but now we're finally back in the swing. And then, uh, so that's kind of getting you caught up on everything that's been going on. But now it's like, what's next? And, um, you know, we'll enjoy this weekend. It's supposed to be really hot out. So we'll hopefully get some pool time with the kids. And then um, yesterday I took Cameron to his first movie. Oh, boy. He's three and a half. We took him to see Secret Life of Pets 2. And we took him to Chunky's, and anybody that doesn't know what Chunky's is, it's um, a place you can order food, and you have a waitress or a waiter during the show. So you order food, drinks, whatever, but you sit in, like, Lincoln Town Car seats that are on rollers, and mm -hmm. they recline. So he sat in his own seat, like, I would say, 80% of the movie, and then at the end, he came and sat on my lap. But, like, he was laughing. He watched the whole time. He didn't start getting start crazy. So that was encouraging that he can go to sit through a whole movie. Um but I posted a picture on Instagram of me, him, and my wife. And in the background on the screen, it was an advertising for The Lion King. Mm -hmm. So I think everybody thinks I was like a horrible parent and brought my son to see Lion King. Why? Because they were like, it's a sad and there's scary lions. For a three and a half year old, that would be kind of scary because Mufasa's, or the uh, scar, right? You know, the bad lion uh -huh. and the hyenas. That's kind of scary for little kids. Is it really? I know. I, I would if if you're a parent you understand it, but if you're not a parent you're like why is that scary? It's like kind of like can anybody guess if I have kids? <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, and then but Monday, me and you are gonna uh, drive to Atlantic City. We're gonna pick Nate Andrews up around 9 a.m. Monday morning, and we're gonna drive to Atlantic City because he's fighting Thursday night in the PFL. That'll be on um, ESPN two. So we'll drive out there. We'll spend the week out there, and then uh, he fights Thursday night. And then early Friday morning or late Thursday night, depending on how we feel, we're going to drive back to Rhode Island because Greg and uh, four other guys that I manage are fighting Friday night. And um, so we'll go back to Twin River Casino, be there for them for those fights, and then we'll, we'll be back late, late Saturday night or early Sunday morning. We'll be back, and then we're back to it. Boy, oh, boy. You, have you ever been to Atlantic City? No. no. I'm excited, actually. Yeah, it should be good. Uh, I've heard horrible things about it. Why? I don't know. One of the coaches from Vegas was messaging me. I was like, oh, when do you get there? And he's like, uh, Sunday. I was like, oh, I'll be there Monday. He's like, get ready for the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> he goes, this place sucks. <laughs> so I've never actually spent time there, but I've driven through. But we'll see how. Uh, uh, here they have casinos. I don't know how it's different than every other place that has casinos. Yeah. I don't know. People from New Jersey. Well, that, that does make it worse. Yeah. So... Yeah, so we got that coming up this week, and then we got the bunch, all the go those guys fighting on on uh, CES, and then we got um, a, a gang of guys fighting, uh, you know, on Combat Zone and Cage Titans in you know late August. But before that, uh, I think August 9th is Pam Sorensen. She's gonna fight for the Invicta title again. Oh boy, your fanny pack friend, Pam. Yes. You need to walk out in a fanny pack. Brendo would freaking love it. She hates fanny packs. Yeah, but I know. her boyfriend Tom wears a fanny pack now. That he does. Tom's the man. He's in yeah. the club. I like him. Now, I don't Tom, know him, but I like We him. like Tom. Pam, you need to step up your fashion game because uh, fanny packs are actually cool. Yes. And uh, she hates them, though. I, she just, she hasn't, she needs to embrace it. I agree. Embrace. Pam, wear a fanny pack. Get it. Um, so yeah, so she's got August 9th in Kansas City. She's going to fight for the Invicta title again. And then, like I said, a bunch of guys on Ca Combat Zone and Cage Titans late August. And then Andre Sugumtoff. End of August is going to go to Shenzhen. He's going to fight um, in China. In China. Gotta be, you know, I like the matchup. Obviously tough flying to the other end of the world to fight in a different time zone. Um, but it's a good matchup. It'll be, I think, while it happens, it'll be, like, annoying. But I think years down the road, he'll get that experience of going to China and fighting. It'll be something he probably talks to his kids about when he gets older. Um, so if he can come out, come out there with a the win, I'm, I'm super confident that it's a really fun, it's a good fight that he should be able to like get a good finish. Um, so I'm excited about you know him coming off that fight in April, and then really like showcasing his skill set because the kid he won against, um, you know, the Jonathan Martinez kid that he beat in Moncton is now two wins since then. He just got performance of the night last Saturday in Sacramento. That kid's a beast now. And then that's got to give Andre confidence going into his next one. So I'm excited for that. And then after that, October 5th in Australia, Jorgen, 
and his uh, squad going out there to. Uh, Jorgen says he's going to do a shoey after he wins. I do not recommend it. <laughs> but, Sounds uh, disgusting. You want to explain what a shoey is? Um, as I understand, as I understand, I'm not Australian. I've seen this on TV. They put a beer into a shoe. Someone spits in said shoe, and then you drink it. <laughs> right out of the shoe. That's disgusting. He says he's going to do gross. it. It's gross. No, he, you should advise him not to. I told him not to do it. Talk about bad life decisions. That's going to be one of them. <laughs> so, Jorgen, we'll see if you do a shoey. Um, I feel like you get caught up in the moment and end up doing it, but I would not want to do it. No. No. Uh, and the people that do it, I, just, it, I cringe. I yeah. cringe. Yeah, so that's what we got coming up. Uh, it's been busy. We got busyness coming up. But, uh, you know, we're excited to have Greg on. I know Greg's busy. He's got the fight next Friday. He's teaching at the Body Rock gym that him and his wife own. And, uh, and he's got the kids that he wrestles with all day. So I'm excited to have him on. We're going to Skype him in in a minute. And uh, it'll tell a little bit about his story. And um, I'm sure he'll troll us because that's all he does. He just makes fun of me. And um, you know, I've talk never to seen him. him do that. <laughs> we'll talk to him a little bit about his fight coming up, a little bit about you know, how he got into MMA, and then kind of him, you know, he's transitioning to being a coach. You know, he coaches some high-level guys. And... I think he's got a really good knack for coaching, and he puts in the work. So I'm excited about his coaching future, but I'm I'm not overlooking his his fight next Friday, which is a, a title defense. He really wants one of those new shiny belts that CS is doing. They, they are much nicer. Yeah, they used to do these green and red ones, but now they have these black ones with gold. It's everybody wants one now, so he's excited about that. So yeah, we'll have Greg coming up in a minute here, and uh, you know we appreciate you guys tuning in. Yeah, we also got some questions from the fans too, so that yeah. should be fun. All right, all right, cool. All right, we got Greg Gabello here on uh, Skyping in, taking some time off his day uh, out in Rhode Island. I think you're working at the, your Body Rock today, right? Yes, I've been there since 5 a.m. Oh, jeez, forget that. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Greg. I know you got a fight next week. Uh, we, we already talked about that a little bit earlier, but um, so we just want to have you on. Like, Greg's a pioneer in the, in the New England MMA scene. He uh, plays he's kind of similar to me. Like, he wears a lot of hats plays a lot of roles like Greg's still the CS heavyweight champion he's still an active fighter he's the main event next week in CES but he's also a head coach to some MA fighters he's a striking coach to other MA fighters he's a teammate to a bunch of fighters but he's also a mentor to a lot of young fighters and then on top of that he's also a dad a business owner with his wife and um, probably top two online trollers in all of New England I would say right Fair enough. Yeah, that's <laughs> who would assessment. be ahead of you? I don't know. I just feel like if I said number one, then someone else would get mad, so I left top two. All right. Who do you think? Who well, else is good? Better, troll? I mean, I don't you, you are the most aggressive troller. It's constant. Like I can't put up anything without Greg. Just like even if I'm dead on, like accurate, he's just gonna say make up something to make me look bad. Yeah, because it's easy, Tyson. I make you believe that you're wrong and that you're an idiot. <laughs> It's I, true. I approve of this. I approve. <laughs> so, Greg, we'll get into it a little bit. I know you got. Uh, you know, you're at work today, but um, so I guess just tell for people who aren't familiar with you, how did you get into MMA? A little bit about your background, maybe tell us about your family. Um, well, as far as MMA goes, you know, I, I played hockey my whole life, so you know, I got into it. I had my first fight in 2005, and I, I honestly started training like five or six months before that fight, so I didn't exactly know what I was doing, but uh, yeah, I played hockey my whole life. I always loved, you know, physical combat sports. And uh, I played uh, in the junior hockey leagues. And when you're, you know, 20, 21 years old, that's kind of the cutoff of, uh, you know, when you, when you stop playing. So I just needed something else, just something different, some kind of other, you know, physical sport or, or something to do. And, and I kind of literally fell into MMA with uh, Pat Schultz. I'm sure you remember him. He's another guy that was around for a long time. And, uh, yeah, I went with him. We started MMA together. We, we made our pro debuts together on the same night. Uh, the rest is kind of history, to be honest with you. Were you a goon in hockey? I'm what? Were you a goon? Like, were you the guy that they, the I'm enforcer? Not a goon. I was a goal scorer. You were a goal. So my son's my <laughs> son's name's named after Cam Neely, the goal scorer. Cameron Sagan. Cameron Sagan. After two hockey players, two there of my you favorites. Go. So you get you can't you, you can't fight in high school, but can you fight in juniors? Oh yeah, you can fight in juniors. You get five minutes, just like the NHL, and then you get sent back on the ice. It's great. Did you get in a lot of fights? I, I, I mean, yeah, you know, I never shot away from him. I don't think I started any, but, you know, like, if there's a lot of dead time in hockey, a coach will send the goon out to fight whoever, <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's kind of what spices things up, and it, 
a lot of times it swings momentum one way or another. So you used to be a lot heavier. I know in high school you were you're a husky boy. Um, what did you weigh when you played hockey? I was a fat lead. I was a fat hockey player. Um, you know, when I was a junior in high school or a sophomore, I think I was 16 and I was like 300 pounds. And uh, by the time I was a senior, I had lost, you know, a ton of weight. I think I was like 200, 205 when I graduated. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so when you were in juniors, you were like around 200? When I, I think it was between my junior and senior year, I believe, is when I lost the majority of the weight. Um, I think as a junior, I was still probably like in the 260s. And then by the time I was a senior, I got down to like 205. And, uh, and then I started like, you know, working out and lifting weights and all. Greg, that must mean you have spectacularly strong ankles. You were that big on skates. I was terrifying. Dude. It was awesome. <laughs> I was like, you know, I don't know. It was like I said, I was a fat lead. And so I, I still was a good hockey player. I was obviously slow. But I remember like when I was a little kid still watching videos to this day of people trying to hit me and just kind of bouncing off of me. And it was it was fun. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I got to see those. Did, now, now, how much, when you transitioned to MMA and started training with Pat Schultz, how much did you weigh then? Um, I think at that point I had started, like, you know, lifting weights and working out. And obviously, you know, as you get older and kind of grow into a man, I, I started to get a little more muscular. So I was probably 240, you know, 235, 240 when I first started training MMA. Uh, my first fight, I think, was at 220. So I was a little bit heavy. You know, I was like 235 probably when I first started. And then eventually you transitioned down to... 85. How many times did you actually make 185? I only made it twice. And the two times that I made it, I was two. I was 213 one time, and I was 217 the next time, the next day, like when I entered the cage. And that was when the, I fought Dan Kramer, I was 217 when I walked into the cage. So that was the Ultimate Fighter tryouts against yep. McRae, right? Nope, I fought Josh Bryant. Okay, and then the Kramer fight in Bellator. So those are the only two times you fought 85. Two times I made it. And you went 0-2. Yeah, oh, weight cuts suck. It's kind of like Vegas. My 85 and Vegas are both kind of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you mean by that? What about Vegas? Well, I mean, listen, <laughs> when I go to Vegas, from now on, I don't fight and I don't gamble because I don't win. <laughs> <laughs> so Greg, uh, he tried out for the Ultimate Fighter. This is back in what, 2010? 12, 2012, 12, 2011, yeah. I think. I would say 10 or 11 because I think I was still amateur That's when you did it. You're right. It probably was 10. 9 or 10. And because it was right when I first started training with you, I remember I was like all starstruck. And you went out and you tried out for the Ultimate Fighter. You lost to get in the house, so you didn't get on. And then fast forward back to two summers ago, so 2017, you were on the yep. first episode of Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series. And uh, you were killing this kid. And then you just freaking got caught and um, lost. And then came back, won one more fight with CES. And then last time we went back and uh, he was fighting. And it was a kid that admittedly, like, and he knows this, like way better than. Like if you fought that kid in the gym, it would be like you, you try to help him because you're so much better than him. Oh, no, but it's- It's a fight. Listen, when you fight in the heavyweight division, as you know, like I feel like the percentage of those fights that end in knockout are very high. Yep. And it's just, I, I feel like a lot of times it's, you know, when you have two power punchers that are willing to strike, it's kind of who lands the first shot. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people after that fight are like, you know, I don't know if you have a chin anymore. I don't think, you know, maybe you should think about stop, you know, stop fighting or, you know, if, if I didn't have a chin or if, if I should have hanging up, I would know it in training. You know what I mean? In my sparring, yeah. I would be getting hurt. I would be getting, if I got clipped, I'd be getting hurt. I would just know it. You know, I've seen it, not to mention any names, but I've seen guys in the gym that I've had to have conversations with that I'm like, listen, you got to stop. Like it, enough's enough. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm not one of them, you know what I mean? That's, but it's heavyweight division, man. A lot, you, you get clipped on the chin by a big guy. I don't care who you are. Man. Yeah. Especially those shots that you don't see coming. He, he hit you with a spinning, so, spinning back fist. It's like, it's a surprise shot. Those are the ones that knock you out easier. Than, I've, ne I've never even trained. Like I've ne nobody's even really thrown them at me in training. So it's something that I've never seen and kudos to him for doing it. Cause yeah. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't expect it. <laughs> That was a tough one. And then, um, yeah, so you're 0 and 3. I'm 0 and 1 in Vegas. I got, and I got freaking knocked out too. So me and you were little Vegas buddies over here. Well, I'm 0 and 3 in front of Dana White three times. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess talk a little bit about uh, you, know, you have Nicole, you have two kids. You're like a base. 
I don't want to say stay at home dad, but you have the kids all day. You have Cameron all day, basically. Uh, yeah, but I mean, you know, we, we kind of switch off a lot, so it's you know, like I, I'm at the I'm at the gym. You know, like this morning, I was at the gym 5 a.m. I taught class. I had a bunch of clients, and she was here with the kids, and then we kind of switch off, you know. But a lot, like the kids are getting older, and at the gym now, like we have a kids' room, so it's kind of easy because we have babysitters in there. We can kind of put them in there while we work. So it's it's we're pretty lucky. It's pretty convenient for us both, you know. Um, but yeah, we have two gyms. We just opened up a second location, like only not too far from my house, literally like three miles. Um, so yeah, it's going good, man. What's the name of your gym? Uh, Body Rock. Body Rock Fitness and Nutrition. And what's this, like the business model of the gym? You guys train, it's mostly females, right? So I would say, we were talking about that the other day. I would say it's probably 95% females. Um, but yeah, it's mostly like a lot of group classes, you know, whether it's upper body, lower body. I teach a lot of boxing classes there. And then there's just personal training during the day. So there's classes morning and night, personal training during the day. I mean, like, you know, I, I have a full cage in there and I have a full setup for me to train fighters and to train myself. So uh, it's pretty cool. I, you know, I can kind of do everything under one under one roof. And uh, how, how old are the kids now? Uh, my son is three and my daughter is six going on 25. <laughs> Could your three-year-old take Tyson in sparring? <laughs> Did you hear that? Can you hear us? A little bit. Oh, so uh, can, can your three-year-old take Tyson in sparring? Well, my three-year-old and Tyson are the same height, so yeah, <laughs> there's no reach advantage. <laughs> um, all right, so transition a little bit is obviously you're still fighting. You got fight next Friday night, CES main event on UFC Fight yeah. Pass. Um, you know, we're looking for a quick finish there. I'm excited to see you get back in there. But aside from fighting, I think everybody talks to you about fighting, but like me and you've talked about this extensively over the last few years. Like, obviously, your future down the road, long term, is coaching. And I think you've taken yeah. a, a liking to coaching. You know, for those of you who don't know it, like you corner me with Calvin Cater every time he fights. You're his striking coach. Um, you work with a lot of other guys down in Rhode Island. Um, you know, you corner a, a lot of guys. Um, Randy Costa, you know, he's in the UFC. You're, you're one of his striking coaches. So, like, I guess just tell us about, like, how it's been coaching athletes compared to, like, being an athlete yourself. Um, well, you know, I have a lot of experience, obviously. I mean, you know, next Friday night will be like my 36th fight or something like that. Um, and and I, I have a, I'd like to think that I've, I've got to train with a lot of great striking coaches over the years. So I've kind of built my own style from there. So I think I have a pretty good wealth of knowledge with experience in, uh, you know, with the top trainers and obviously as a fighter myself. Um, but, yeah, you know, I, I think I just – I feel like, you know, I, I have a pretty good formula of I, I know what it takes to compete at a high level. Um, and, and I think that I'm pretty good at, you know, breaking down video and, and picking certain things in certain situations that we can capitalize on. So uh, I love being a coach, man. I like watching video. I like cornering guys. I like to see, you know, guys improvement over, over a camp. And uh, it's exciting. Man. I think um, one of the things a lot of people don't know is like, so Calvin obviously he's got three Three, he's three and one in the UFC. Sorry, four and one now. Three, but three knockouts, right? He's got that one decision on short notice over Philly, but he's got three knockout wins, the last two in the first round. Um, but before the Shane Burgos fight, when he got that third round knockout with him, you know, we sat down and we brought Greg in to be his striking coach. And I think one of the big things that I think you really did for him, Greg, was really teach him how to keep his feet underneath him to, to sit on punches. Cause he was throwing a lot of arm punches before he was winning a lot of like exchanges, but he wasn't knocking people out. So I think one of the, I, I'd say like from my point of view, like one of the big differences I've seen in Calvin is his ability to land power shots. Like, is that mm -hmm. something that you guys, I, well, I, I, I already know the answer to this, so I'm leading you into it, but like explain how that works. Like what did, what were the big changes you made with Calvin to like see the significant difference? So, so for me, it was always two, it was always two things. Every time I watched Calvin fight, I knew he was a super athlete, a good wrestler, and a good striker. But he, he stood very squared up, and he didn't move his feet. If you could go back to, like, his Chris Foster fight, he just stood in the pocket. I mean, his, I've never taken that much punishment in a fight. His face was a mess because he just stood in the pocket the whole time. He didn't move his feet, and he didn't have anything on his shots because he was standing square. Yeah. Um, so the, the two biggest things that I did is I, is I, I tried to turn his stance a little more towards boxing. Um and, and then, you know, to get him to move his feet, whether it's pulling or coming in, you know, if, if he's got a close distance now, he can close distance with his feet. 
he's a big guy at 145, and he's very long, and, and I feel like he didn't use it before. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, I think those are pretty much the two biggest things that I changed. And, and obviously, Calvin's work ethic, man, and he's a very coachable guy. Um, you know, so obviously that goes hand in hand with just showing him a few different things. But, yeah, he's got three – Three knockouts, one in the third round, two in the first round since I've been with him, you know? Yeah, two first-round knockouts in a row. I mean, and last one was, uh, and we talked about this a little bit on the intro, was against Ricardo Lamas, who was number nine in the uh, in the world and had fought for a title before. So I think that was, it broke the kid's jaw in three places. Um, obviously, it's impressive. Like, I'm excited about, like, what's next for him. Like, wh- who do you want to see him fight? Like, if you had your wish list, who's he fight next? Yeah, I mean... Dude, I, I I seriously think Calvin's he's going to be the best in the world. I mean, I'm, I'm that confident in that kid's skills and in his development. Um, obviously, there's, you know, he's floating into the top ten, and and with a win like that and how he did it over Ricardo Lamas, you know, we're obviously hoping for an, a top five opponent next. I mean, I'd put him against anybody, honestly. Yeah. I, I like, I, I think a huge name would help a guy like Jose Aldo, um, but anybody in the top five, you know, I'm excited about because I think he can beat all of them. I agree. Did you watch the fight, Brendo? I saw a, a stream of it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was on uh, ESPN TV. Oh, on, you don't have cable? No. Uh, Brendo doesn't have cable. He's one of those cord cutters. But one of the... One of the <laughs> so that's all that matters. <laughs> one, one, of, one of the people that was there for him was streaming it somewhere. Oh, someone was doing like an uh, Instagram Live type thing? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that happens. Um, I guess we, we do have some questions for you. Uh, I don't know if you want to ask those, Brendo. Yeah, I can definitely can do you that. You can hear Brendo. He's talking. Yeah, like can girl. you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I'm all right. It really talk doesn't like sound like you can. Talk like I don't a man. know how. I'm not a man yet. Suck air into your chest. <laughs> all right. Uh, the first question Basically from the fans. Subtle. First question from the fans we have is: What traits do you consistently see in successful fighters? Um, it's just consistency. You know, guys. The biggest thing is that drives me up a wall is you'll see a guy win a fight or lose a fight. You know, they're partying and they don't show up to the gym for months at a time. And then they come back in. And by the time they get another fight, you, I feel like we get to start over again at square one. And if, if you're not consistent in the gym and you're not always there, you're never going to improve. The guys make their improvements when they're out of camp, when you're working on stuff, when you're trying new things. Because when you get into camp, at least for our guys, I, I feel like it's like a strict regimen of what we want you to do. You know what I mean? If, if we don't like one thing, we're going to be like, all right, you're not doing this for this fight. So why are we going to work on it in camp? But out of camp, like, for instance, when I hold mitts for Calvin or for Randy, like, we screw off with different things just to kind of see, you know, maybe there'll be something that they're comfortable with and that will work in a fight, you know what I mean? So you kind of build a little bit more on the attribute side when you're out of camp, in my opinion. So the absolute biggest thing is consistency and guys that, you know, stay in the gym. And guys like Calvin and guys like Rob, they always train. They're, you know, they may take a week off after the fight because, they, you know, they train so much. And uh, their camps are so grueling, so you, you get it. You want to go on a little vacation, have a little alone time or whatever with your, with your friends and family. But being consistent in the gym and uh, making improvements when you're out of camp is the biggest thing, in my opinion. Is there anybody that you'd like to call out that's inconsistent? <laughs> is there anybody that I'd like to call what? <laughs> call out that's inconsistent. Yeah, he's standing on the right here. <laughs> All right. Um, next part. Next next question we have from the fans is: uh, What is the hardest part of fighting and coaching at the same time? Um, you know, obviously, I think a lot of people would think that it's too much on my plate because it's, you know, how can you train yourself and game plan and make sure you got the right sparring partners and all this kind of stuff, and then go and coach and hold mitts at the same time. But I don't know. I love it, man. I love the sport. I love, like I said, I love the whole game planning and all that kind of stuff. I mean. At one point, I was fighting and coaching Calvin and Randy at the same time. Like, so it wasn't, I don't know, it's just not a big deal. I don't, I don't mind juggling, you know, quite a few things at once. So, um, you know, I, I guess you could say that finding all the time to make sure that you're, you know, getting the right preparation yourself and obviously making sure that your fighters are prepared too could be difficult. But, you know, I got the hang of it. It's not that big of a deal. Do you ever, so I was kind of doing the same thing back when I was active fighting. I was coaching some of the guys. Greg, do you ever find it hard to, not because obviously you need to get yourself ready for a fight your fights are important <laughs> but i found when i did it i was like too much i was putting the their needs in front of my own yeah but i knew long term i was never gonna go to the ufc or anything like that so it wasn't like a huge deal but like do you ever find issues with that like where you're sacrificing your own training to like help them a little bit and trying to find that balance 
Well, that's one thing that I never did. You know, like if, when I go to Lozon's on Saturdays or if I'm at Triforce on Wednesdays, I make sure 100 percent and I let those guys know that. Like I'm getting my sparring and my grappling and all that stuff in beforehand. And then we can work on stuff afterwards. Or right. a lot of times I'll spar first. Yeah. Like, like we did with Calvin for, you know, I, I, I'll spar first and then I'll come out and I'll watch him and, and coach him. You know, right. so sometimes it, whether it was me sparring before or sparring after, you know, you, you can always make adjust things and move things around to kind of make it work. Right. All right. Next uh, fan question is, uh, do you think that being a fighter can help has helped make you a better coach? Absolutely. I, um, you know, if you look at, I mean, all, all my coaches have all fought, you know, um, cause I can't, I can't sit in a cage and listen to somebody in between rounds, tell me to do something if they've never been in that situation. You know, it's, it's tough to, you know, like, I feel like if I'm sitting in Calvin corners, you know, in the corner and me and Tyson going in between rounds and I say something to him, you know, I feel like he trusts that and he believes in that because I've been in those situations before I've been you know, in the third round of a fight, in between rounds, when you're gassed and you feel like you have nothing left. To like, you know, I just feel like experiences like that and, and, and fighters trust coaches that have fought before. Like, if you've never fought before, how are you going to tell me what to do? You know, that's just my opinion. Maybe I'm a jerk, but whatever. Greg, I use the analogy of uh, I've gone, like, you know, I think some coaches, and I, we, we talked about this when we had Brock on. We had Brock and we were talking about coaching, and we were saying how, I don't think you need to have fought to be a great coach, but I think there's certain things that you got to kind of stay away from where it's like, you know, like you said in those, um, you know, in between rounds when you could tell the guy's tired and, you know, you can look that guy in the eye and be like, listen, I know what you're feeling. Like, suck it up. Like, you trust me, like be tired in five minutes. Like they, they're kind of like, okay, I get it. I get it. But if some guy comes in there and is he, did he freeze? Yeah, Greg, I was telling, we talked a couple weeks ago to Brock on the phone and we were talking about, if you need to be a, a fighter to be a good coach. And I don't think the answer is yes, but I do think there's certain things that you should stay away from. Like like you were saying in between like the second and third round, when you go in there as a coach and you're like, listen, I know you're tired. I know what you're feeling. Like you just gotta suck it up. You gotta you know, suck it up for these five minutes. We'll be tired in the locker room after. That guy can look back at you and be like, all right, I got you coach. Like I know, you know, you can pull that yeah, out no, of him. I, I 100% agree versus, with that, you know, because I, it's, if, if I've been in that situation, you know, if, if, if you're cornering me, I know you've been in that situation, so I'm going to trust in what you say. You know what I mean? That's just, yeah. again, that's just my opinion. Some people, I'm sure, think I'm wrong, but. No, and I, like, I that, do think. That, that's just me. Like, if yeah. I, like, my coaches have all fought some sort, whether it's amateur or as a pro. Right. So when they look you in the eye, if you know they've never fought and they're like, you got to suck it up. I know you're tired. Like, your natural reaction is going to be like, well, no, you don't. Like, you've never done this. Like, I feel like you're, you're kind of in that bitch mode where you're like, in between the second, third, you're tired, you're hurt, you're like pissed off, you're just annoyed, you want to get over with. And then you're, you know, one more thing gets thrown at you, be like, I know you're tired, I know you need to suck it up. It's like, oh, no, you suck it up, dickhead. Like, I, I'm tired, you're not tired, you don't know what this is like. So I think um, sometimes that can happen. I always, I think I use the analogy where I've been, you know, because some coaches would be like, oh, I've cornered enough fighters, I get the mental side. It's like, well, I don't think so, because like, you know, your wife's had two babies, but you don't know what it's like to give birth, right? You were there both times. <laughs> you know, so that's why I say, Thank God. you know, like me and Sarah, you know, we've had two kids, but I don't know what it's like to have a baby, but I've been there. I, I've cornered for a baby and you know what it's like. You're like, no, you're fine. You're like, F you. <laughs> so I think it's, yeah, kind, yeah. it's kind of similar, no, but um, yeah, no, I do think, I, I think Greg hits a solid point there where it's, you can relate to the fighter on the mental side of it. Like they know that you've been in the trenches, but I think on top of that is like when you're present during camp and you see that emotional roller coaster that they go to through those, go through for those like eight to 10 weeks, you know, when they're, they're having rough days, you know, when they're having good days and you've had those conversations with them dozens of times already in practice, those same conversations that you're going to have with them in between those rounds, you're having with them in practice. So you, you, you've, you've practiced that conversation. You know that if I say this to him, he's gonna shut down. Versus if I say this, I'll probably get more out of him. So then you kind of use that experience that you have throughout camp and you bring that into that one minute that you get in between this first or second or second or third round to like really motivate him to get what you need out of him. And, and that's also the good thing about having like a consistent coach that goes to a lot of your practices because that's how you build like the best chemistry in a corner. And I think that's super important. You know, because obviously you're going to get to know, you know, the goods and the bads and the pros and cons of certain guys and, and, and 
you know, sometimes there's certain situations where you can yell at guys and other guys, you know, everybody's different, like mentally. So how they handle it. Some guys have mental breakdowns during training. So, you, you know, you, the more time you spend with a fighter, obviously you're going to get a better relationship and you're going to have better chemistry. And so that's super important. Like if you got guys that don't show up to the gym a lot and they just coach you a couple of times a week, it's going to make things a little difficult in my opinion. Yeah. What do you, uh, what do you find the most rewarding thing about coaching? The most boring thing? Rewarding. 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 Thing. Um, Rewarding. Listen, you can ask Tyson. When Calvin Cater knocked out Shane Burgos, and, and you know, we look up in the air and you can see the Celtics banners and the Bruins banners and the rafters and how crazy that place was. For me, I can tell you right now, that was probably the best moment of my MMA career, whether it's as a fighter or as a coach. I, I put that number one. I mean, that was just, that was like a bucket list thing for me to be able to fight at the garden, you know, see him fight at the garden, win like that see how crazy that place was and, uh, you know, be right at center ice. You know what I mean? I, I've been watching, you know, hockey and basketball games there my whole life. So for me, that's number one. Like that, I don't, I don't think you're going to be able to top that. It is cool seeing them realize their dreams. You know, like the, Calvin getting back into MMA, he, you know, he's told the story before. It started with a phone call to me saying, hey, I want to fight at the Garden. And I'm like, well, that's not really how it works. And then two years later, he's fighting at the Garden and knocking a guy out and bonusing on the main card and the feature belt on a pay-per-view, it, it just couldn't have gone any better. And, and it was like the way the fight was. It was like we were winning, yeah. then we were kind of losing, and then it was like, hey, you got to suck this up. Let's go out there. And then he just does it. And then at the same time, the next week, the Patriots are in the AFC Championship. It was just – it was awesome in Boston. It was freaking – that was insane. And, 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 and same thing like – and same thing with, with like the whole – what we just talked about. I mean that fight was 1-1 going into the third round. So what do we have to do? We have to hype up Calvin and like get him going because you know the second round I think that he was you know he lost the second round and it's kind of like all right the momentum swung the other way, so we have to kind of like hype him up and get him going. You know I there think, was really kind of nothing left to say but that you know. I think I called him a pussy in between the second. And the oh, second. you did. I was like, I was like, dude, you're fighting like a bitch. I was like, you need to freaking suck up. I was like, do you know how to brawl? I was like, D can you like man up and fight? Like, do you do you know how to get in a fist fight? And he like looked at me like who the hell are you? Like, and I'm like, I just need you to like, you need to go out there and put fists in this kid's face and come forward. And then you would called out the call sign, you know, step, step in with the one, two, and then just cracked yeah. them. And then the rest was autopilot. Well, like that. We, obviously it was cool because it's like, you see that, you know, it was not that he was tired, but it was a very close fight. And it was a very competitive fight. We, we both know how good Shane Burgos is. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's still one of the top guys in the UFC and to see Calvin go out and then, capitalize on something that we worked on i mean we worked on that combination like for the whole camp you know like because we knew that you know that was something that would work and you know see him do it and then obviously see him win because of it it was pretty sweet you know? and you can hear it on camera like if you go back and watch you can see like step in with it and then he did and then you knocked him out it was like you were saying i think you said step in with it or throw it and bring your feet or, or he said something of the sort but you heard you call it he did it and it, it was it was freaking awesome. And then after he landed that big right hand, the, the couple uppercuts just made it look real cool. Um, that was just uppercuts, Calvin being Calvin. Yeah, that, Calvin Pretty goes sweet. into kill mode on autopilot. It's awesome. Um, Speaking about Boston and the Garden and all that stuff, can uh, you give us your perspective on MMA in New England? I'm sorry. Can I get my – I couldn't hear you. Can you give us your perspective on MMA in New England? Like right now? Well, I mean, obviously, if you look at this Boston card, if it plays out how we want it, I mean, we literally could fill up the whole main card with talent. You know, um, there's a lot of guys that are starting to break through from the area. So it's, it's you know, I feel like we're starting to get the recognition that we deserve. I mean, we just had Jorgen win and get signed on, on the Contender Series. Calvin and Rob are, are basically broken into the top 10. In, in my opinion, they're both going to be even higher than that. Um you know, and there's a lot of young, young up and coming guys that are going to be doing the same. So I, I think we're starting to get recognition we deserve. I mean, I think that this is the has to be the most, you know, New England guys that have been in the UFC that I can remember, you know, at one time. Um, and everybody's doing really well. So, yeah, I think I think this is the highest level that we've ever had as a group. You know, we've had I think, you know, obviously Kenny fought for some titles. Joe was in kind of like a a contender fight when he fought Pettis. But right now, collectively, you know, you got all these guys, you know, Calvin and, and Rob that are ranked. You got Manny Bermudez, 3-0. and um, You got Joe, you know, possibly fighting again. Mike Rodriguez obviously coming off a loss, but he's still, you know, he's a scary guy at 205. You got Jorgen just crack, cracking into heavyweight. 
Um, you got William Knight fighting in a few weeks on the Contender Series. You got a few other guys from New England fighting. I think Fabio and um, uh, Jay Perrin fighting in the next couple of weeks Jay on the Perrin, Contender Series. So, 30th. Yeah, so we got like just a lot of guys like potentially could be in the UFC. I mean, already we have more than we've had, but we get more that could happen. So I think the state of New England MMA is like, it's the highest level it's ever no, been. Yeah. I mean, they're taking a lot of guys from Cage Titans and from CES. You know, Tony Gravely also just got yep. on the CES champ. Um, you know, so they're, it's pretty sweet, man, to see all these guys getting an opportunity. And then obviously some guys capitalizing, them. not me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Greg, if you could give one piece of advice to a young fighter, what would it be? Um, good question. Uh, I mean, obviously back to the consistency thing. Like if you're going to do it, make sure you do it right. Make sure you stay consistent and you're never going to improve. Because there's always going to be that one young, hungry, hardworking kid that's just going to, you know, be a step ahead of you the whole time. And then the the biggest thing too is is you got to find the right team. You got to find the right squad. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of great teams out there, but it's, you know, kind of how you and your personality and, and everything fits. But uh, finding the right team is not easy. You know, um, I mean, I know I have a lot of coaches. I travel a lot. I you know I go I go to a bunch of different places. You know, I got three guys from three different schools cornering me. Um, next Friday night, you know? So I, I do a lot of traveling and finding the right team and the right fit and the right coaches is, is definitely, it's hard. It's taken me years, you know, to, to get the right guys in my opinion. Um, so that, that, that would be number one right there. I agree with that. I think the consistency, the consistency thing is important. Yeah. I think a lot of people can learn from uh, like the way they see like Rob and Calvin train. I only speak to them just because I'm one of their coaches. I manage a lot of other guys that work hard too, but I'm not one of their coaches. So I always use Rob and Calvin as an example. You know, they, they train, even when they don't have a fight, they're in the gym doing the meat and the potatoes. They're at SOS doing the strength and conditioning and, and they're doing all that other stuff. Um, but then, you know, something I'll tell young guys too is like, you, you need to have a guy, you know, like everybody points out these great fighters, you know, obviously TJ Dillashaw popped, but he had Dwayne, you know, you look at Mighty Mouse, he had, uh, Matt Hume, you look at, yeah. uh, you know, John Jones got uh, Jackson Wink, obviously he's got a few guys there, but like all these great GSP, you know, had Faraz, like everybody, all these good fighters, they have a guy that's like, yeah. that's the guy they look at and they're like, that's my homie. That's the guy that's like, he knows me better than anybody. You know, you it's look like at the one guy that kind of overlooks everything. Yeah. I mean, you got, John like, Jones has a bunch of coaches. He's got a wrestling coach, he's right. a jiu coach, a but, boxing coach. But, but I'm sure he's got that one guy. Mike Jackson's the one who overlooks the whole process. Right. And then you got like young fighters that we have, like Mitch. Mitch looks up to Brian like he's King Brian, which is very important for a young fighter. He looks up to, you know, he's got Brian and Tommy there. Those are his guys, you know? Yeah. Um, he even shares the last name with Brian, and they're not related, but... Of course. Um, but, you know, like, he has a guy. So, like, these young fighters that... And I'm just starting to know this is, like, over time. Like, Mike Rodriguez, like, you know, like, he's got Joe and Steve. Like, those are his guys. And then Jake's filling in there now, too, to become one of his guys. Like, you know, you yeah. see, like, they all got, like, a dude. And um, I think that's, that's hugely important when you have, like, someone that you feel like is on the same page as you. And that is... It's truly, like, all right... This, this guy cares just as much about my career as I do. Um, I think these young fighters, they have to figure out like who that is. And that guy will help shape your team, you know? Whether it could be, it could be one guy, it could be three together, wh however it happens. But if you don't have that one person that you can go to and be, ask honestly, hey, is this the right gym for me? Is this the right coach for me? Is this the right strength coaches? Is this the right place for me? Are these the right sparring partners? Like if you don't have one person like, having their hand in every bit of your your world, your MMA world, like I think then you're gonna have a lot of the the silo effect. And then you're gonna have like, oh, you do striking here, you're wrestling here, but they don't talk to each other. So now like of course. that coach is working on something totally different than what you really need for the next fight. So I think you need to figure out who, consistency, and then you need to figure out what team fits you because no, there's no one size fits all. Every camp's good for certain fighters, bad for others. You need to figure out who your guys are. And if, if and, and you definitely have to have like communication between all those guys as well, you know, like yeah. all, all those guys need to interact with each other, you know, and obviously run ideas off each other. And uh, that, that's a huge part, too. Yeah. If you if you talk to a young fighter, and you say, hey, listen, like, who's your head coach? And they can't tell you that's tough, you know, because then you're like, yeah. well, I see oh, why I you're struggling, you know. Um, but I mean, that, I think that's a consistency thing overall, though, even if you don't have a guy. And you're not consistent, you're gonna do horrible. But if you're if you don't have a guy and you're consistent, your your chances are way better. But I agree. You're gonna need any uh, 
I have one more, and you can answer it or not <laughs> if you want. Who is your favorite fighter to train, and who's your least favorite fighter to train? <laughs> um, you know, I, I like all the guys that I train with because if I don't like them or they don't work hard, I tell them to see you later. Like, you know, I'm like, I, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not going to waste my time if guys aren't going to work hard, but. You know, I, I guess I could say Calvin. He was my first guy in the UFC. I mean, you know, I love coaching him and I love coaching Randy, but Calvin was my first guy that broke into the UFC. So it was always it was always fun, man. You know, like it's been fun so far, but by far and away the worst guy I've ever coached because he drove me up a wall because he was by far and away the most skilled and the most talented out of anybody I've ever coached and anybody I've ever trained with. And there's not even a close second is Brennan Ward. Um Talk about a guy that had the attributes and the skills and just the athleticism more than anybody that I've ever seen, but just didn't take it serious because he didn't like it, <laughs> it was Brennan Ward. I mean, he was so – when he was on, I, I, there was nobody better. But, again, the consistency of the training and the consistency of his mindset, you know, he, half the time he was in, half he was out. Some fights he'd show up and, you know, I remember like – Scott Coker or Bjorn Revenue back in the day, like, Jesus, man, who is going to beat this kid? And I'm like, well, if he fights like this, nobody. But then other times he would show up and he, he looked like an amateur, you know? It was just, it was fun, <laughs> but it was crazy. And it was very difficult, you know? It was very hard to kind of control him and, uh, and to read him. You know, I got to become real close with him and his family and stuff. So he stopped fighting and it was probably for the best. But uh, he was the most, it was fun coaching him, but it was, it, was, it was tough, you know? It was tough to deal with because it was, I, I hate seeing guys that just waste good talent like that, especially with him. I mean, he was like next level talent, but he was, <clears throat> yeah, he was scary in the gym because he was so unpredictable. You don't know if he was gonna. I saw him one time. It was funny. We were drill, just warming up, and I was running a class. We were warming up, and I, I partnered him with this like high school wrestler that was just in the gym to kind of like get some work in on Christmas break or whatever. I'm like, Brennan, just go light with him. Like he's a, he's just a wrestler. He's like a teenager. And he's like, all right. So then the kid like, I think like kind of like took him down a little bit, like drilling. And then Brennan got on his hands and knees and started like barking at the kid <laughs> and be like, all right, you want to go? And I'm like, Brennan, calm down. And he, but that's, Brennan's not being mean. That's just like, he's having fun. And uh, that's his personality. Yeah. Like you know, he, but I think that's half the reason, half the thing that made him great is he was crazy, man. Like he, he did couldn't not control care. him. Yeah, You know, I, I used to walk into the gym and I'd see guys that were, you know, sparring that day, just look at me and be like, oh, man, you know, <laughs> they would get bummed out that he even showed up because they, you knew if you were sparring Brennan or you were training with him, you were in a fist fight. So, yeah, I think he's probably the only guy that ever let, uh, uh, who's it, Daly, Paul Daly up because he wanted to throw with him. Didn't he let, he Paul, didn't he let Paul Daly up in their fight? Then he got knocked out, but he like had him down and he let him up. And he's like, all right, let's go. Yeah, because Paul Daly was like, I thought we were going to strike. And Brennan was like, okay. Then, you know, <laughs> I mean, a national champ wrestle level wrestler just takes the kid down at will. But then all you got to do is talk crap to him, and he'll just fall right into your game. Fans love that, though. You know, that's why they he does resonate probably. well with the fans. He's exciting to, to watch. Um, do you got any else, anything else for Greg? Uh, no. Get back to work. You? No, nah, man. I'm just excited to see you fight next week. Um Obviously, I'll be there, but, you know, main event, UFC Fight Pass, CES Heavyweight Champion, defending your belt, you're going to get one of the new shiny belts. So uh, that'll be something that you can hang in your house for the rest of your life. And, uh, no, I'm excited. I th you know, thanks for coming on. I'm excited about next week, and I'm excited about, you know, what's coming with some of the guys that we work with together. Hell so, yeah, man. We got, a, we got a lot of work to do coming up. So. All right. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Got it, buddy. All right. I think that went good. I mean, we had a... A few technical difficulties that Howard might have to edit out, but and Greg was having some trouble hearing you, but uh, it's I always think it's Greg's fault. It probably it yeah. probably is your fault, Greg. Um, I'm glad you know that was insightful. Hey, Greg, Greg's a guy that I looked up to when I was first getting into fighting. I was like, yeah, I trained with Greg Abello. Like I, he's probably gonna make fun of me for saying that, but you know he's been around forever. He's a uh, a mentor to a lot of the young guys, so it's it's good to hear him like kind of talk about how he got into it and. You know, we're excited about his fight coming up next week, so I'm glad he was able to uh, pop in. Nice. So we were talking earlier about, you know, summer vacation, things like that. You been to any lakes lately? <laughs> no, I've not been to any lakes, but that does remind me. I was talking earlier about uh, the, how the last six weeks have been. I totally forgot I went to Minnesota. <laughs> That's how crazy my travel schedule is going to be. So we had Maurice, the crochet boss himself, 
fight in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, his home state, first round knockout. So now Maurice is 3-0 and in the UFC. Um, crazy, you know? He's uh, knocked out the big baby, Junior Albini. Knocked him out, for, you know, TKO in the first round. I think the uh, the new camp at uh, Factory X with Mark Montoya is paying dividends. I got to see Mark Montoya like in action for the week, and it was cool seeing him like have a, like a routine for Maurice, and Maurice really looks up to him. So I think that's been a really good fit, and uh, you know I'm excited for what's next for uh, for Maurice. But three and zero in the UFC in the heavyweight, I think he's got the second longest win streak in the heavyweight division, other than Daniel Cormier. Mm-hmm. So you're in good company there. Yeah. So congratulations, so is that Maurice. The next, is that the next fight? Him, him, and Cormier. Yes, we're yes. fighting DC Perfect. in Boston. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, no, I think that's all we got. Do you get anything else, Brendo? Uh, no, I got nothing. So one thing that you know we got a lot of big fights coming up. Let's try to support these guys. Um, we're gonna be in in touch about you know we're probably gonna end up doing T-shirts for the Boston show. Let's just finalize who's on the show, and then we'll probably do some bright shirts to say New England Cartel on them and just make the whole crowd wear them. It'll be pretty cool. And then one thing that. Um, I've been trying to figure out is, uh, you know, when we have these long travel breaks, I think it, it ruins the momentum of this. So one thing I've been toying around with the idea of is just getting some audio stuff to just be able to do just audio only, record it while I'm on fight week, and then I can get the recordings to uh, our boy Howard. And then at least we can still post up like just audio stuff with cool people that I see on fight week. Because there's a lot of people that like play big roles in this MMA world that I get access to while I'm traveling um, that I think would be interesting for people to hear their stories um, but obviously, we you know we're easier to just do an audio, sit down in their hotel room and just do it. So that's something we're going to toy around with. Um, hopefully, uh, w- you know we can do something like that and figure out how to work that. But I think that'll give people a different perspective on while we're traveling. Like even me, you next week we're going to be in Atlantic City the whole week. We could probably do some stuff there together mm-hmm. with whoever you know we're with. And then um, you know we try to get more consistent. It's just hard with the travel sometimes. Trying to be in, you know in studio all the time, but yeah. I think uh, so. Yeah. So sorry for the delay, but we appreciate everybody uh, continuing to uh, support us. And um, yeah, we're excited to just wish these boys some luck. You know, this weekend with on you know Leon fighting. We didn't mention that, but he's fighting tomorrow night. And then big fights next week, six guys. And then you know just keep going. And then obviously we didn't even mention William Knight. Uh, he's the last guy I'm fighting on the Contender Series August 13th. So I'll be back out in Vegas for that. Hopefully he can get a contract. You know kid's a beast so uh yeah no we appreciate the support and um we'll be back soon and we're just trying to keep things going bigger and better every time howard we're out i did howard we're out that time do you see that that's good